Um, I'm just looking at the time. Does it start now or quarter past when I was supposed to start? <laughs> just, just checking. It's supposed to start at 20 past. Oh, okay. Righty-ho. So, um, look, I thought I'd just get straight into this. I think my talk actually fits very nicely on Arno's, um, and I'm going to try not to re repeat it. I think if you take what he said and then lay layer it over what I say, uh, you'll see we're, we're basically in the same area. So, um, just going back to when... Uh, New Zealand Food Safety Authority, as it was back then, uh, first came across sequencing uh, MLST, multi-locus sequence typing for Campylobacter. We had a little issue with, with Campy. We had another issue with a particular sector that didn't really think it was their fault. And some classic micro uh, out in retail showed that it probably was their fault. And then Nigel wandered in one day with some beautiful MS, MLST uh, spider diagrams and said, look at this, look at this, poultry, 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 human, 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 human. Sorry, I mentioned the, the, uh, the <laughs> sector then. Apologies, uh, poultry industry. But that was enough in 2006 for the poultry industry to, to sort of go, mea culpa, no, we'll do something about it. And by the end of 2008, uh, they put in a lot of work and we had dropped the, the notified campy rate by 50%. Um, uh, so that shows you, that showed us the power of having some genetic, if you like, uh, indicators that were able to link uh, human cases to a, to a particular uh, food product. Um, so if we come on another uh, X years since then, sort of 15 years after that or, or plus, um, some of that work was repeated uh, to just see whether the, the current attribution rate uh, was, and, and, and whether we'd managed to reduce it, and we had, but, but it actually still enabled us to look again at, at the attribution of, of poultry and other sources to, to the, the human cases, and, uh, and it's given us another direction uh, for what we're doing now with Campy. More importantly, I think was, and I alluded it to before, was the, the Salmonella enteritis outbreak that we had uh, basically starting uh, around about May 19, no, 2019 uh, and continuing through um, really until about six months ago, um, when after a, 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 a big outbreak in a, a restaurant in Auckland, um, ESR went back and they did some whole genome sequencing on the human isolates they got from, from associated with that, that outbreak. And lo and behold, they all had the same uh, sequence type, oh, not sequence type, the same uh, whole genome sequence. Um, and I think it was five SNPs within a five SNP variation. And, um, and that was interesting because that tied in with work after that, which showed more cases popping up around the country. And what was the key was before we knew that at New Zealand Food Safety, We'd, we'd lost the A by that stage, by the way. We had New Zealand Food Safety at this stage. We had a detection in the National Microbiological Database, which one of the students mentioned, uh, from poultry meat, and it was the same whole genome sequence. And so we thought, wow, what's going on here? So all of the human isolates were then, were then sequenced. Whatever we could get hold of that was an SE, that had come through ESR for their testing and through industry um, were then sequenced. And at, while that was being done by ESR, we were looking at the epidemiology that went with it. So we we're saying, well, if it was, if it was our poultry meat or it was in eggs, did the epidemiology actually support what the whole genome sequencing was tell, telling us? And interestingly, out of that, we had, we, had a, we had a couple of cows were positive for this particular strain. We had a goat, and they were sort of down, not in Auckland or around the, the round Tua cow and around the area where, where this outbreak mainly was, but, but down at this end of the country. We had a cat in Hawke's Bay, and we had a, a, another cat in uh, Rotorua, and we had a dog up in Northland. And, and the interesting thing is we were actually able to link in the end with the epidemiology, we were able to link everything except the two cats. So I don't know what it is about cats, but we were able to link the, the cow, 
a particular positive shed, uh, poultry rearing shed, and the goat, all through a family that was shifting animals that were sick, and a worker that worked at a, at a, at a, at a, had a farm and worked at, at, the, at the poultry establishment. So the whole genome sequencing was, was absolutely pivotal, pivotal to us connecting the dots and giving us that extra evidence that, that um, the epidemiology eventually sort of told us. And, 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 and then Nigel's team actually and, and Patrick's team even went even deeper into it and they were able to identify or suggest to us when the first incursion of this particular enteritidis was into New Zealand and a subtle change in it that was between this, this restaurant outbreak and then the, 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 the poultry industry uh, uh, detection. So uh, very, very strong and, uh, and we were, you know, almost sliced bread stuff, I would have to say, Anna. So um, if we go on further from that about uses we've got, and I, I'll do this quite quickly, you know, we're using it in our salmonella and tahini, um, uh, either the detections or outbreaks, depends, because sometimes we have detections in product with our import test program, um, as opposed to having outbreaks. And we were able to compare the, the whole genome sequences of those with, with similar sequences in the international databases in the US and other places. And lo and behold, we've had some matches. Um, come from the same country, come from the same company. And so we are able to compare these internationally and that enables us to start thinking about uh, international standard setting and, and, and risk mitigation we can take in terms of that. Same with Vibrio in New Zealand, a hepatitis A virus in New Zealand, we're able to use uh, um, whole genome sequencing to track those around the country and see whether they're the same, whether it's the same spread of the same organism around the country or whether it's a change in the environment that has let multiple different genome types uh, within, say, the Vibrio to actually come to the fore. Uh, so we use it all the time now to, uh, as we can financially to, to track, and through Infosan as well internationally to get these linkages. Antimicrobial resistance, uh, uh, absolutely going to be fantastic in the future that we can look for antimicrobial resistance genes in the, in the genomes themselves without going and running uh, uh, long-winded microbiological culture means of, of detecting antimicrobial resistance. And something I haven't written in here is also now tracking what I call the technical genes within organisms that, that will enable us to, to actually track down pathogenicity um, islands and things so we can see which organisms might be, might be uh, dangerous to us. And also from around food science, we can now find uh, genes that will be technologically useful uh, in a genetic modification or genetic editing sense to, to improve the food supply and, and, and to like give us a whole lot of innovation. I think before I mentioned this uh, thing about taxonomy and STEX, I won't go into that again other than to say that the old fashioned call Roger Cook, Roger Cook is one thing, but actually to turn around and say, well, it doesn't matter who I am, but have I got a gene which will enable me to be a pathogen and to actually uh, uh, stick onto the gastrointestinal tract and cause the illness that I could possibly do may be more important than actually calling me me. And, uh, and that's one of the advantages we will have. That will probably be a few years ago now, but it's a, it's a development that's coming, uh, coming. So just looking at the hurdles, though, I know he's already talked about it. Poor baselines. So if we look here in New Zealand, our baselines of whole genome sequences from pathogens is, is, is very poor um, for very good reason, and it's this thing, commercial sensitivity. Um, if everybody can't do it and everybody can't have their isolates put into a database, then when we pick up something in a human isolate, we're just going to go to those that are in the database and we're going to go, we think it was you. And that's without... But so that's why we have to overlay the epidemiology of it on it. But the companies are really scared that that's what's going to happen, that they're going to find something that's going to get linked to a human case where there was actually never a linkage. Or if there was, it was something that was completely out of their, their, their means to control. And, and, that's, and that's the difficulty that the companies have. Um, the intellectual property, it's ours. We're not going to put it into a national database. We do a lot with it. We have the appropriate controls in place if we find that sequence or that organism by whole genome sequencing or, or any other form of genomics. Then we take action. We have our risk mitigation steps. We do this, but we don't want anybody else to know about it because we've taken it out of, out of, 
out of uh, commerce. It's not a problem. We've put in, we've put in um, mitigation factors uh, to make sure it doesn't happen again, but we really need that to stay uh, uh, with us. Um, again, that inappropriate finger pointing. And of course, market abuse is the worst, is if an international market finds out that, that you had an X gene in your product, they will use it if they can to prevent that product being, being exported to them. So, so there is a lot of, um, uh, there are hurdles, and, and industry are really worried about it, as are we, because of, for, for, for many, many reasons. And the, the, the main one is, is genes versus reality. If you've got the gene, or if there is that gene uh, and a little bit of DNA within a sample, who says that gene was ever going to be activated and was ever going to cause an issue? Who says that gene is actually an alive organism? You know, what happens if that, and I'll, I'll sorry, Kerry, I'll just talk about it, if there's a, a bit of a chicken that have been through a decontamination process um, and there was a whole lot of inactivated organisms in there, but you can still measure their DNA. Of course there's going to be campy DNA still hanging around, but it's never going to cause infection should we be acting against it and should anybody be concerned about it. And that's one of the, the hard parts we have is genes versus reality. Uh, cost, Anna's already talked about that. It's quite expensive. Um, most small, small companies won't be able to afford it. But as you say, the, mini, the uh, nanopore minion will, may help and certainly will help in other countries. But uh, let's see, that might be, might be a few way, uh, years away yet. So what's the solution here? Um, well, we have to keep talking about it because the more we talk about it, the more people can find out what the benefits are. Um, they can respect everybody's views, their wishes, their needs, and we can try and work out ways to, to, to mitigate any risks that they see. Um, because we need to recognise the power that it gives us. And we've seen the power. I think many of the companies that use it within New Zealand have seen the power. And, uh, and I think anybody that's using it around the world can see the power of it, uh, as long as it is linked, is used properly. And if you're talking about human health, it is linked to some solid epidemiology. Um, this proportionate regulatory action, well, that falls on my shoulders, I suppose, or our team's shoulders, is to make sure that we don't jump too quick on something that is not potentially real. Um, we need to put a flag up, and we can put a flag up with the company, and we can mention we can work it through slowly with them and, and see what can be done without some real strong regulatory action. Um, we need to resource it appropriately, and um, that's going to be the hard part. Databases are horrifically expensive to run, to develop and to run, uh, especially international ones. And this, is, this, this gave me a little bit of hope, I suppose, for the future. We don't have the money to pay for it, but, but uh, in Tiara Pairangi, in, the, in the, the, um, the sort of white paper for future reference in science, they talk about databases of national importance. You know, we, we keep the genetic material of the, 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 you know, the DNA sequences or whatever for, for insects and, and, and leaves and foliage. Wouldn't it be great if we could actually put this data from our whole genome sequencing into something that was classified as nationally important? So there's a pipe dream. That's hope. That's still, that's still being uh, the, the, the fine details of this whole future directions uh, pathway still being, being analysed. It was great. It's good. We've got the strategy now to work out how to implement it. That's going to be hard. Um, MB, go for it. Um, and the last thing that I have is this international strategy and consistency. We can do all we like here, but one, and I'm going to call it one rogue decision by a regulator overseas, especially in a major market for us, could actually cause so many troubles. And, and, uh, and even though we discussed that at International Association for Food Protection Conferences and it's discussed at WHO and FAO and everything else, um, Technocrats are great, bureaucrats are, are dangerous. And, um, and so we have to be really, really sure that we've got all of those, what I call political and regulatory and commercial mitigations all in a row right across the world. And that's probably something that'll have to come through through codex or even higher if you can go higher. So um, there is hope. And um, to me, I, I think it's, it is... It's not the best thing since sliced bread, but it certainly should be classified as being up there and uh, something we should follow um, with a passion.
No bell. That's good. 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 Was that a beep? God, look at that. I can learn. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions for Roger? Yeah, I have one. Um, sorry. <laughs> yeah. I thought I was going to have time to give the rest of my talk this morning. <laughs> Um, coming from, say, the milk powder industry, we've been told for years, keep it dry, keep it clean. That will do it. So what would be your 30 seconds elevator pitch to convince me to add genome sequencing in a mix of keep it clean, keep it dry? Well, I think, I think anywhere, any technology that you can use to understand where contamination is getting into your... Into your um, premises, uh, where it spreads within your premises, what happens to it after you clean, whether that be in a, in a wet cleaning uh, situation or whether that's in a dry cleaning situation. Anything that, any evidence that you can have that supports what you're doing and, and validates what you're doing, then it's worthwhile. Um, and, and that depends on the size of your, whether, whether you can afford to or not. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm aware of companies that are, are using whole genome sequencing and it's, and it's enabling them to really, really identify um, those tracks through dry areas and, and through other areas and enabling to put in mitigations. That doesn't mean to say that you have to go and, and, and turn them into wet areas or, or what have you, but at least it gives you an understanding of what is there. Yeah, um, Roger, I, I, hello. <laughs> I, I fully agree with you about the need to um, back up genomic linkages with solid epidemiology. Um, there's already been some discussion about the issue of how many SNPs or allele differences is different. We have some rudimentary rules around judging the strength of evidence for linkage between epidemiology and a food source. Do you think it would make sense to come up with a kind of joined up set of rules that encompass both topics that says if, if you know um, judging uh, strength of evidence by using information from both genomic and epidemiology sources yeah. absolutely Rob um, I think I think if you call them rules then we get into a situation where we can't be flexible enough I suppose the first rule is, treat these as guidelines, not as rules. Because what we find is when we, when we come up against rules like that, they will be used to s prevent you from doing things or you'll come across a situation which doesn't fit. So absolutely, and, and we need something written down as a procedure so that so when some of us pop our clogs, um, the new generations coming through know how to interpret and how to, how to apply what I call risk assessment procedures and protocols and philosophies to what you're doing rather than a, than a stick in the sand. I've, I've always been one about, um, and I'll probably get into trouble with this, I don't like, let's say, a, a, a regulation for listeria that says one at 100, you can have it, you, you can't have your product uh, sold, and below that you can. What's the difference microbiologically between 99 and 101? Absolutely nothing. I've always thought that we need to have a set of guidelines which allows us to say, well, actually, it's sitting within that area. The epidemiology or whatever doesn't suggest that that's a problem. We're OK. Or the epidemiology on the wrong side says, actually, you've got a horrible, dirty premises. You're not doing what you've got. No food safety culture from your management down. Nothing is right. Therefore, I'm really, really uncertain about this. So, so guidelines that allow us to to determine things and cross between standard micro epidemiology, whole genome sequencing is, is really important. Wonderful. Thanks so much. Uh, I think we'll leave it there. Thank you, Roger. <laughs>